Hey guys, welcome to the LT Brings the Heat podcast. We're your hosts, Sean Laird and Adam Heisler, where we talk about baseball and sports performance. With topics ranging from coaching, business, and player development, our goal is to bring you a no BS approach to development in baseball and sports performance. Hope you guys enjoy. Let's rock and roll. All right, hey guys, welcome to another episode of LT Brings the Heat. Um, we're your hosts, Sean Laird and Adam Heisler. Uh, we got an episode today uh, for the Indiana Bulls organization. The executive director, Scott French, used to be the um, Ball State baseball recruiting coordinator, as you'll uh, hear when we intro him in a little bit. We're basically talking about the rules. We're talking about the recruiting process for a freshman all the way through junior and, and, and actually senior as well as the, in the college baseball process. Uh, but we're going to dive into some parents, uh, you know, overbearing parents and making sure you're not hurting your son in any way in the aspect of things. Uh, there's a lot of good stuff here. Adam, what, what was some things that stood out here to help people understand uh, going forward? Uh, one thing that stood out to me was definitely the scholarships. Uh, for those that don't know, as a baseball, you only get 11.7 at the Division One level. And so guys aren't on full rides. Uh, one thing I think that gets thrown around a lot is my kid's committed to so-and-so and he's got a full paid scholarship. And I think Scott even mentioned himself, the highest he ever gave out was at like 80%. So that's one kind of myth out there that I think a lot of people are going to really like to, to hear coming from a coach's mouth as well as now what he does with the Bulls. Uh, what were some things that stood out to you? Uh, one thing that I really enjoyed him talking about, and, and he talked about the GPA with the players and stuff, but I really love hearing guys say, you know, when they go to the field, you know, they're looking at character. They're looking at how guys carry themselves. Um, but on top of that, he was like, we're looking for athleticism. And I think that there's something this guys are like, you know, my son has this tool, this tool, this tool. And there's the misconception. And I, I bring this up in the, in the podcast that there's a question that was asked to me on social media that my son has four tools um, and has great academics, so he's not being recruited. And obviously, that's not true. He doesn't have four tools when it comes to the college perspective because he he said like we'll get we'll pick up guys that have one tool at times if it's a if it's a phenomenal one tool. Um, and and there's he'll dive into more about this, but I really love how he broke down like you know there are guys that have three tools. He's really happy. He's going to go after him. But the biggest tools he's looking for the hand speed, the foot speed, the athleticism, like those three things. And, and, and those are huge things that we hear as a theme for a lot of college coaches. And I really enjoyed hearing. Yeah. When he mentioned those, I mean, those just stand out to you when you watch the game and both of us coach now and you can, it doesn't, what I say is anybody can kind of be their own scout, but just trusting your eyes. Uh, I think some people try to dive way too much into this of, well, his stats against this guy was this, 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 as opposed to just trust what you're seeing. Mm -hmm. If you see he moves well, he has a good arm, he's got good foot speed. Hey, maybe he goes over fourth the plate with three strikeouts, but he laid, he faced a tough pitcher. It wasn't his day, whatever it is from that standpoint. And another thing that uh, he's going to mention in this episode is parents don't compare your kid to another kid just because – he's one kid on the team is committed already or five kids are committed and yours hasn't yet. And he'll mention kind of just be patient. And uh, that was a really big advice that I'm going to even start taking into effect when parents do talk to me about the recruiting processes, be patient, especially during the times that we're in now, because all this stuff is kind of just throwing a wrench into everything. And the last thing I got is it was funny. He mentioned that when this is clear and everybody's ready to get back out on the roads is these college coaches are going to be working their behind off this coming up year, just because they're going to feel behind. So, you're going to be in front of people like you mentioned at Grand Park there's going to be 100 scouts there when you get there players don't feel the pressure of oh my gosh I've never played in front of guys like this just go out there and play the game like you know how to absolutely absolutely and guys you'll hear this a million times in this but everybody's recruiting is their own path everybody's route is different and we'll mention about Adam's Juco route to South Alabama route and me from high school straight to South Alabama um, everybody's different everybody matures at different ages and everybody everybody's goal is to play at the high level, but it's your work ethic and your ability that you put in. That's what's going to separate you. And uh, this is really good stuff, guys. Some of the rules, uh, advice that we have for you, and a little bit of some story here. So hope you guys enjoy. Till next time, see you guys later. Hey, guys. Welcome to another episode of LT Brings the Heat. We're your host, Sean Lair and Adam Heisler. We've got a special guest today, uh, Scott French. He's the executive director for the Indiana Bulls. Um, as well as used to be the uh, uh, Ball State baseball recruiting coordinator. How are you doing today, Scott? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. Of course. I really appreciate it. Oh, definitely, definitely. So I've known Scott for a little while. Um, I Actually, I don't even know how many years it's been, but Scott used to recruit a lot of the Bulls guys that I used to coach um, and when he was at Ball State. Um, and he's a Bulls guy himself, obviously, so we got that, that family relationship. Um, for those that don't know, the Indiana Bulls organization, and, and I talk about this a lot, Adam coaches in the um, – 
Louisiana Knights organization. We're a travel baseball organization. Uh, we have teams from eight years old all the way through 18U. Um, specifically, our premier, quote unquote, premier teams are that 15, 16, 17 year old age levels where we're trying to help guys get exposure and showcase them to college baseball scouts and help them get to that next level. So one thing with Scott, and we're going to bring in his his expertise on the subject for recruiting because he's been doing this for a long time, is kind of help, you know, look at the player's perspective. Um, we're going to look at the, the parent's perspective and we're going to look at kind of the rules and things change every year. So understand whether you are listening to this right now here in 2020 or in the future, things will change every year. Um, but the actual template and the knowledge that you're going to get here today from Scott um, is, is something you can utilize forever. Um, Scott, go ahead and introduce uh, kind of like your history from the coaching as aspect of things and it kind of got you where you are today and, and your playing history as well as your coaching. Yeah, so you mentioned the Indiana Bulls. I played for the Indiana Bulls uh, when I was 17 years old back in 1997. Um, and they, pro they provided me several options uh, that I wouldn't have had because I grew up in a very small town, southern Indiana. So uh, the Indiana Bulls really kind of moved my career forward just by getting me out in front of people. And back then, there wasn't a whole lot of organizations doing that. So I'm appreciative of them. I went to Ball State University, uh, played four years, won two championships, played with uh, four first-round draft picks. Uh, and I played for uh, Rich Maloney, who I ended up working for uh, at Ball State um, for six years. I was at – so after I played at Ball State, I coached there for, for 10 years in two different stints. I was a volunteer coach for four years. I uh, stepped away for a little bit, uh, and that's when I actually started coaching the Bulls some, and then came back uh, to Ball State. So I was uh, I was the recruiting coordinator for six years. Um, and then uh, last year, I got an opportunity to become the director of uh, baseball for, for the Bulls. And if it doesn't feel like a job, it feels like I'm giving back to what they give me, they gave me. But it's a, it's a good gig, and I love it. And I've always been in – uh, outside of the, the college coaching, I've always been uh, in, involved in development and training of, of kids ages eight to, you know, through their college careers anyway. Mm -hmm. So this kind of goes hand in hand with, uh, with you know, similar to what you're doing with kids. So uh, in the training aspect of it as well. So happy to be here. Um, I don't have all the answers, but I'll, I'll do my best. And uh, <laughs> I do have some experience, so, so we'll see. And I had to make some phone calls because – I haven't been out there in two years uh, in the recruiting world necessarily, and thing, things have changed, and, and they're mm -hmm. going to continue to change, it sounds like. So absolutely, we'll to that as we get going here. Yeah, and that's it. with, with COVID-19 going on, and there's, there's going to be repercussions for this, and, and a lot of college coaches are already starting to experience this with the draft being shortened, uh, kids coming back, and, and then the incoming freshmen. There's so many aspects of this thing that's kind of having such a domino effect right now. So this is a great opportunity to have – a podcast like this right now. Um, I kind of want to dive in the beginning. Um, and Adam, you could jump in on this after this question anytime you want, like from the recruiting and the tool standpoint, and, and, and we're talking about tools, like for the listeners, you know, we're talking about hitting for average. We're talking about hitting for power. We're talking about having a glove. Uh, we're talking about speed. And, and obviously we're talking about the arm. We're talking about being able to have all those tools and utilize those tools that can compete and project at that next level, whether it is college baseball or obviously in the professional level. Um, and there's a lot of confusion when it comes to tools. Like you could say, okay, have five tools, right? Or have, you know, four tools or, or somewhere along those lines. And there's a big disconnect. And, you know, I have obviously with Lair's training, I'll, I'll post up on social media. And I, I had this question one day about, I, I basically said, hey, college coaches are not looking at your stats. They're looking at your projectability. They're looking at your skills. They're looking at what you can do, what your tools show they could do against the top level competition in the country. And one of, the, one of the parents was like, well, what happens if you have a kid that has four tools and awesome academics, but he's not getting recruited by anybody? And my immediate answer, to be blunt, is, well, obviously he doesn't have four tools because he'd still be getting yeah. recruited. <laughs> so um, let's let, let kind of break this down for us a little bit. Like if you, you know, when you were at Ball State and you were looking at guys and you're showing up, you know, what are you specifically looking at when it comes to tools to play Division One baseball? I think you look at present tools, wherever they're at, if they're 15, 16, 17. So they're present tools and, and the projection of where you think their tools can be. Mm -hmm. um, at the mid-major level, when we were at Ball State, we had to project a little bit. Uh, we weren't getting the ready-made guy necessarily. And in some cases we did, but uh, if you find three tools in a recruit, that's ridiculous. Mm -hmm. You want to find those two. And 
the carrying tools for most kids are the arm and the, and the, uh, the foot speed because it's really hard to hit. I Absolutely. Mean, I, I, I'll tell you that the hardest thing for us to project on was hitting. Uh, unless the guy was a no-brainer, if he's a no-brainer, I guess he was, I mean, Major League Baseball is taking that guy. Mm -hmm. So, um, for me, the, the hitting piece uh, was hit and miss. I mean, it, we, we had a hard time taking a, a one-tool guy if the, if the tool was the bat. You can't have too many of those guys on your roster. It's just, it's tough. But that's not to, that's not to say that we didn't take them. We did. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just you can't, you can't build a team – with just that one tool. Now, if you have one tool and your best tool is your arm, guess what? You are your pitcher. So, I mean, yeah. if you – one way or another, you know, if they come in as a position guy or whatever, I mean, if your best tool is your arm, you, you need to consider yourself a pitcher. Mm -hmm. So, um, finding those tools are rough. Projecting those tools, I mean, there's some, there's some difficulty in doing it, but uh, you also look at a kid's athletic frame, his athleticism. Um, athleticism, competitiveness, willing to, willing to do what it takes to, de to keep developing those tools. So I didn't recruit this kid, but I know this kid. His name is Jeremy Hazelbaker. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't know if he's around your age or not. Yep. Jeremy Hazelbaker came to Ball City. He ran a 6'9". He, he was six foot four, had a good frame to him. He ran a 6'9". He ended up running 6'4". Two years later, he was a fourth-round pick. Uh, left-handed hitter, you know, and his best tool was his was his run tool, but the bat came along as he, you know, as he got older. Um, but that's a guy whose tools, like, really jumped even when he got to college, uh, and he kind of made himself a player. But it was through hard work. I mean, he did it. We didn't to say that we developed him. I don't. I don't know about that. But yeah. That, you you look for. I think if you if you find a guy with the drive to do what it takes to to continue to get better, guys just get better. I mean, there's so many stories of kids that, that got missed in high school. Still, today, they get missed, and then they go somewhere, and they grind it out, and you don't even recognize them two years later because their, their tools continue to get better. Now, present tools, I mean, it, it, you're not going to find power in a high school kid. If, if you do, it's, it, it's, it's really hard. You know, yeah, yeah. it's gap, it's player. basically gap to gap, right? Yeah, yeah, it's gap power. I mean, when we were talking to uh, Jeff Mercer the other day on the Zoom call, he said, "I mean, if you're a college player, you have to hit at least 12 home runs for you to have power, where you impact the game." Mm -hmm. And he made a good point. He said, "He said if you don't, um, if you, if the home run's not in play, so if you're not hitting 12 plus, how else will you impact the game?" How else can you impact the game? With your feet, with your arm, with your gloves, with your tools, right? Yep. So he just looked at it as if you're not going to hit ball at the ballpark, what are you going to do? And that's what I would tell families. If you don't impact the high school game and you don't have a ton of projection, you're not going to impact the college game. But if you have that projection and your tools continue to get better, then that impact might end up showing up. It's hard to hit. The one thing that I did learn through, all, through the recruiting – if a guy doesn't hit in high school, he's probably not going to hit in college. Absolutely. And he could have the, pretty, the prettiest swing ever. If he's hitting 250 in high school, you know, it's going to be really hard for him at the next level. There are cases, and I know, I know some cases, but when a guy hits, he hits most of the time. So I don't know if you guys agree or, or, or disagree. Yeah, with that. 100%. Like hitter, hitters hit, and, and you nailed it on the head right there. It's especially from a mid-major at Ball State who and, and Ball State's obviously had a lot of success and you guys have like just produced draft picks out of that college. Um, like it's, it's very easy. The guy that throws 92, that's 6'3", 215, that's easy to recruit. The hard part is, is, is the hitting aspect. And, 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 and a lot of part of this, especially the people listening, like, you know, everybody can hit that 75 to 82 mile an hour fastball at the high school level. Like a lot of guys can do that. But like the projectability, like when you're watching guys recruit, you want to see the guys that hit against that high velocity. That's what's going to transfer more over to college. And that's why it's so hard because how often do you like you, you'll go to a game and you don't necessarily see a guy throwing 86, 87 miles an hour against those hitters that you have to recruit. You kind of have to hope and project based on what the tools that you see that he that fast twitch or that quick twitch is going to transfer to that 90 plus in college. No doubt. Uh, the swing and miss as well. So 
you, you try to stay away from the swing and miss when possible. If you swing and miss, you better hit the ball at the ballpark. Mm -hmm. uh, Mercer brought up a good point on our Zoom call the other day that um, he likes to see guys at least recognize spin. You can teach mm -hmm. them how to hit spin if, 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 you, if you can recognize that they can see it. They can lay off of it. So th that was a big thing for him and his recruiting. And he's had a lot of good offensive teams wherever he's been too. So I'd, we had a really good offensive talk the other day. Um, but I, I, I'm totally in line with that. So yeah, you, you got to be able to hit the velo. And, and it takes bat speed to do it, bat speed and timing. But the, the whole breaking ball thing was something Mercer in there that made sense as well. So Yeah, that makes, that makes total sense, Scott. And I'm glad that you brought up the hit tool because from a speed standpoint, the clock's going to tell you how fast you are. And then from a throw one standpoint, the radar gun's going to tell you how hard you can throw. From that hitting standpoint, you mentioned it's kind of the hardest one to recruit. What is some things that you look for? You mentioned bat speed and, like, pitch recognition. Was there certain things that even if he went 0 for 4, it's not necessarily he just crossed him off the list where he had some good at bats? He saw pitches. Yeah. They hit the ball hard on the barrel two or three at three of those times. What were some things that stuck out to you when you would watch it? Yeah, well, what kind of a bat he takes, um, pitches he lays off of, um, will, will he take the walk? Is he going to get on base? Outside of, outside of you know, getting his hits, how else does he impact the game to get on base? On base percentage is a big deal, obviously. Um, from a mechanic standpoint, you want to make sure his lower half can connect with his hands a little bit. Uh, you see bad lower half hitters at, at times. And for me, it was, it was about the rhythm and how the lower half got ready a, a lot of times because I can fix the hands in the barrel uh, angles. I can fix his angles and his body positions. Does his body function? Mm -hmm. uh, so that – from a hitting standpoint, that was at least what I was looking at. That's good stuff. But if a, kid, yeah. a lot of times you find if a kid has arm strength, they have bat speed because mm -hmm. of how their lower half works, as long as their arm path is clean. Um, so we took, a, we took some chances on some arm speed, foot speed guys. Um, one of them was Alex Cole ended up being a third rounder. I, got, I saw him play two at bats for, in Chicago his junior year. I got two at bats. He threw a ball 97 from the outfield. He ran a 6'9", six, 6'8". Six, I saw two at bats. He was a three-sport athlete. Uh, his bat-to-ball skill was really good. Uh, he, he just didn't miss. I mean, I talked to several people before I actually offered him. Mm -hmm. But uh, he ended up having, like, a really good bat-to-ball skill in college. His, his hand iron was ridiculous. Um, but we took a chance on him, and he, he was really raw, Wisconsin raw. Played 15 games a senior year. But came in, and he, he did all the work, and he developed himself, made him a player. I think he's in high A with the Indians now. But, yep. um, yeah. That's – um. we just had – we me and I, we just sat down with Mercer actually last week and had him on and, and talked to him. And, and uh, we the big thing he was talking about is, you know, hitting obviously is the hardest part to recruit. And he would always say, like, you know, we're going to take some chances on those athletic guys, the guys that have some fluid and have some ability, like – we can teach those guys hitting in a lot of aspects and teach them a good approach and help them with timing and help them with positioning, strength and stuff. But, you know, the big thing that, like, we, we will recruit when it comes to hitting aspect, the thing that we rely on is that athleticism, especially, like, he was talking about at Wright State and then making that transfer to IU. Like, you go after the athletic guys, and, and for those that are listening, the guys that are athletic, he's talking about quick twitch. He's talking about guys that have the ability to run, hand speed. He's talking about, you know, being able to throw well. Uh, the quick twitch. Basically, you're looking at a guy that's an athlete that if you throw a baseball player on another sport, he's not going to look out of place, essentially. Um, and that's the way kind of I, I, I look at that. Um, is there anything you got yeah, to add? Yeah. Just to add to that, Adam, I'd be – I'd like to hear your opinion on this because we're in the north where our, mm -hmm. guys, our guys get less in bats. Um, mm -hmm. They just do. They get less BP on the field. They get less at bats than your guys down south. And it takes us – you know, a couple of years to catch up. And, and a lot of times it doesn't happen until kids do get into college and they get that, that kind of reps. And um, it just seems, you know, I've seen the Knights play several times when I was recruiting Atlanta. And the, the Southern kid just seems to be a little bit of a, a head in that whole taking in at bat um, type deal. So No, yeah, I think you're hitting the nail on the head there from a standpoint of, I mean, we get to get on the field here for high school baseball in February. So they're starting in February. Not only that, but there's maybe only two or three months out of the year where they can't be on the field due to weather. So if you say they're going to be out there eight months out of the year getting their practice in, 
as opposed to hitting inside the cage. I understand the cage is important, and especially with weather, where up north we have that advantage of all of our practices most yeah. of the time are going to be on the field. And I think that's where ultimately the game speed and the game sights, the adjustments, everything's happening there, so they're comfortable. Whereas the northern teams that would come down here, we'd play them at South, when we were at South Alabama together, and they were a little behind. Maybe they were missing routine fly balls because they haven't been out in the sunlight lately, or they weren't up to full speed, which I would say it takes them 10 to 15 games to kind of get going to catch up to game speed. So I think you hit the nail on the head, too. Another big thing down here down south is football is humongous. And I think so many of the kids play football and the baseball combo aspect. And just going back to the athleticism standpoint is they're always doing something, whether it's moving, mobility, and just being able to translate from athleticism, like Sean said, of when they get put in another sport, they don't look awkward out there. They're moving just because they know how to. Yeah, that's a good point. Now, I will say uh, the, benef the benefit of a, northern, of a northern player, if you're a northern player out there, is that scouts still give you some projection. Mm -hmm. uh, the southern player, just from talking to some scouts that I know, the southern player better be re ready to go. Um, yeah. But the, they, give, they give the Northern player sometimes more of the benefit of the doubt that he will project more as he plays more against higher level competition. So. Yeah, that makes total sense. We were actually just talking about this the other day. Uh, somebody asked, said, how did Mike Trout go 25th overall? And I said, I mentioned he's from New Jersey or Pennsylvania. I'm not sure which one, but he doesn't play year round. Yeah, so he's not playing year round and going to these perfect games all the time and doing that stuff. I said, that's why – they had the late projectability, and now you look where he's at now when he gets to devote his time to doing this all the time, full year. Yep, yep. And I'll, I'll add on to that, too. Like, we'll, we'll play Excel Blue Wave, I feel like, it seems like every year in Atlanta somehow. Like, we'll play those guys, and, and you watch, and you'll play – and we play the Scorpions and, and, and teams like that, and you watch kind of the, the mannerisms, the swag, and the comfort, the, the comfort that they have at the plate, um, picking up spin or seeing pitches and being able to make sure they're not – you know, their 2-0 swings are a lot different than our 2-0 swings up north a lot of times. And I don't want to dive into, like, you know, philosophies and stuff like that, but I think you guys are really on the same part here. It's like the more you do something, the more comfortable you're going to get at it. And, you know, if I'm, if I'm a scout or if I'm watching that stuff and, like, and, and Frenchie, you know, when we're at tryouts and we're watching guys hit BP and stuff, you can see the rhythm. You can see the tempo. You can see the swagger. You can see the confidence. You can see that stuff. Um, and that's a big aspect of things. Like, you know, we go and we'll play certain teams – and it's not a coincidence that those same certain teams every single year have those characteristics that you see at the plate. Yeah, no doubt. Um, I kind of want to dive in this, and this is something that's really confusing for people is, um, and, and there's always, I don't want to get into, you know, too blunt, but there's always that woe is me, like why am I not being recruited at this time? Could you break down for our listeners, you know, the difference between the freshmen and the sophomores that are recruited uh, early in the process of recruiting versus the the juniors and after this we'll kind of dive into some of the the rules and stuff as well yeah i mean uh there was a shift in recruiting i'm guessing 2000 between 2013 2015 mm -hmm. and that's right when i started recruiting there was a shift to where um some schools were going young going early having kids on unofficial visits but they were going young they were getting out in front of the curve and they trusted their ability to evaluate a 14, 15 year old kid. Because when when you when all of us played, we got recruited when we were 17, right? Mm -hmm. I, I never had a scout at a 16 year old game, ever, let alone nope. 15, let alone 14. Yeah. <laughs> but but that's that's the that's where we're at. Uh, and you know, us with the Bulls, we got a couple guys committed at the age of 15, and they're they're really good players, and they. They, they understand because I'm their coach that they better keep working mm -hmm. because um, – and, and I, don't, I don't worry about either one of them. But it, the whole recruiting landscape is they're, they're trying to get you early. And, and the two guys I got committed, they're both really good players and, and they make good decisions. But uh, when that all went to early, that actually did not hurt us one bit at Ball State because we were on late bloomers anyway. We were on – and we always had the money left over to be able to uh, – you know, we were that guy with money, with scholarship money, when everybody else was done. Mm -hmm. and, and that actually worked to our benefit more than it would have been if, we'd have, if we would have tried to recruit a 15-year-old kid. 
Um, now, and we tell people this, we talked about this at the Bulls uh, player parent meeting, the recruiting process happens early for some, later for, later for most, actually. Yep. Um, I mean, if you look at even our Bulls program or your Knights program, um, we're still getting a lot of sophomore, junior, and even junior to senior. I'd still think the majority of our commits come at some point during their junior junior year, whether it be the fall or you know the spring. But um, it's just it, as long as people are are patient with the process and they continue to work, uh, they can't look at other kids and say I'm better than that kid, but he's going here or there. That happens a lot. Um, they they just need to keep on their grind because. Uh, you just never know. I mean, I, the the scouts are getting more looks at guys now too. Well, not not during this time, but typically uh, guys get more looks on these kids, so they get more comfortable with them. And I think kids are making the right decisions. I don't I don't feel like I don't feel like they're getting recruited too young because uh, they're getting they're getting seen. And those, and I think every, all the adults kind of put the kid in the right spot, being the parents, the coaches, and even the colleges. I, the colleges recruit a 15-year-old kid longer than they would recruit a 17-year-old kid. Yeah. Because if it's a 17-year-old kid, it's a, it's a right now, and they're going to put a little pressure on you to, to come get you. Mm-hmm. Um, but, the, you know, of the, of the young kids that I know that were recruited, uh, the one kid we got going to Tennessee, he was on campus three times at camps. He got to know the coaching staff because I, I called him and was like, hey, you know, I just wanted to make sure these kids aren't making impulse decisions. But they had they had, had a relationship. They had been on the – he'd been on the phone with Tennessee for a year. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, so I think the people that are doing it young, it, it, it seems to me that they're doing it right. They talk to the parents a lot. You know, they're not uh, – everybody's getting informed. So – so uh, to di- kind of kind of dive into that a little bit more, the the how early is too early for a freshman or a sophomore to make that commitment, and like, what's your personal opinion, your recommendation, on when to make a commitment to a school, and at the same time, um, what how many schools should they approach or or talk to essentially before making that decision? Kind of what's on your rules on that? What do you tell your guys? If you're young, it either has to be your dream school, or you have to have several options would be my recommendation. So if you're young and you're good enough to get recruited that early, you need to really dive in and look at several options. Now, um, the older you get, the less options you may have, but for some guys, uh, they have more options because they, you know, they've developed over those two years. Mm-hmm. But I, my, I mean, I, I would never tell a family when to commit. I would just say, if you're going to commit early, make sure you have more than more than a couple options, so you kind of get how the whole recruiting process works, uh, so you can compare. Gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, and you and you're sitting in a great spot where you were a college recruiter, and now you're doing this with the Bulls, where both you and Sean can give advice to these parents. Uh, one thing I would recommend to parents that are listening to this is go to guys like this and ask them questions. Don't just try to sit back and make the decisions on your own. Use the guys that have had experience doing this. And I think one key thing that stuck out to me was when you mentioned the don't compare yourself to another player. Cause I see that happen more than anything is coach, this guy's ranking is this and my ranking is this, I should be going here as opposed to like we got to the very beginning was projectability. Maybe he's six foot three, 210 and could even grow more into his body whereas maybe you don't have that quite yet so can you just kind of explain of committing to a school maybe that you have a relationship with a coach and not so much about what's the name across the front of the jersey just to say hey I committed and I'm the first one in my class to commit yeah uh don't just commit to commit that's for that's for darn sure the relationship matters you need to have a relationship with the head coach the head coach writes the lineup the head coach makes pitching changes um, it's obviously it's good to know the recruiting coordinator and to know you know if you're a pitcher to know the pitching coach, and that all matters. But I, I think you gotta have a, a pretty good relationship with the head coach because he he makes all the important decisions. To be honest, um, I'm sorry. Did, what was the second part of what you just said? Yeah, just how important it is that not getting caught up into the name across the front of the jersey. Oh, yeah. Of the, yes. 
Yeah, no doubt. And, and to touch on the ranking piece, too, um, I know in the South sometimes you guys use perfect game maybe a little bit more. Up here, we, we were, we've been using – from a recruiting standpoint, I used Prep Baseball Report. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, did, I didn't really get caught up in the rankings. It was more about the video uh, and the metrics. And now there's even more metrics involved, mm-hmm. which helps – um, which helps recruiting. The metrics matter to some schools. They don't to others. Um, it just depends what they are. I mean, velo is velo. We, we obviously know that. Exit velo can be uh, a little tricky, I think, in, in hitting, mm-hmm. uh, especially if it's done off a tee and it's not done in the game. I agree but, completely. <laughs> but, the, yeah, the name, you know, whether you want – different different players, different families want di- something different out of recruiting. I knew from a mid-major when I called certain kids that I would, you know, if they're being recruited by big schools, I would be up front with them. Do you want to go to a big school? Are you open to coming and, and, you know, maybe playing right away or having the opportunity to play right away? What's important to you? So, like, for me and and how I ended up at Ball State, I was recruited by several schools across the country um, and some bigger schools. For me, I had a good relationship with the head coach in my recruiting process. For two, they were pretty good, and I, I like to win, uh, and they were pretty good at the time. And, and for three, I knew I'd have an opportunity. I mean, I, opportunity to play. I, I wanted to play. I, I, most of these kids never said bench their whole life, and then they get to college, and that's the first time. So it's a, it's a, it, to get back to that, whatever the family – most of the time a family needs to figure out what's most important for some people it's, it's finances. I want the biggest offer I can find. Mm-hmm. And that's fine too. I mean that, you know, but different people have different needs, different. Um, and they want some, some guys really want the big school. Some guys just want the best fit. I think it's, it's to each their own uh, when it comes to that. Yep. And that's definitely something that everybody needs to. And I always tell guys like, you know, you need to write down, the goals that you have, the objectives that you have, like you need to know, like, what do you want to go to school for? How much, like you said, the big thing is like, how much is money important? Now, obviously with baseball not getting full ride scholarships, you know, a good scholarship, you know, 25 to 50%. There's a lot of guys that are averaging somewhere right around that range. Um, and most of the guys, you know, from the high, high end range of the scholarships are going to be the big arms, the power pitchers, you know, and, and guys up the middle on that aspect of things. And with, with parents constantly comparing themselves to – or comparing their son or, you know, to other players, um, there's a big disconnect when it comes to that projectability and the tools. And what, what, what is your opinion on why that is the biggest disconnect? So you got, like, a parent's like, well, my kid's got a 2.2 ERA and he's dealing in the summer ball versus somebody that's 6'3", throwing 88 miles an hour. Maybe he gets hit around a little bit. What, what, what's kind of your rationale? How do you explain that to somebody for them to understand, like, you know, it's not about your stats. It's not about what your kid's doing dominating Jimmy down the street. Like, what is it about? Well, I would – if a parent approached me with that, I would, I would say, go watch a college game. Tell me where you think your son wants to go to school and go watch that school play. And then, and then be honest with yourself. Do you think your kid can play on that team? Because mm-hmm. everybody, everybody loves their son, okay? <laughs> There's nobody that's, that's going to sit here and say, I don't love my son. They're, they're always going to be their biggest fan. And that's totally understandable. Um, but the, the nuts and bolts of it are um, the college game is different than the high school game. It's more physical. It's faster. It, it, it requires um, – and depending on what level you're playing at, and that's why they have different levels, right? Division one, yep. two, three, and, and kids end up in certain places for reasons. And um, parents just got to got to look themselves in the mirror, and and hopefully they trust a person like you that trains them, or a person like me that trains them, or you you know, um, that we wouldn't send them down the wrong path, but we we'll also push them to get better. Mm-hmm. So I'm I'm pretty dirt honest with people, even the kids that I recruited. If they wanted to know where they were, I'd tell them this is where I see you today, and this is where I see you three years from now. Mm-hmm. Um, this is how I can help you get here, you know. But uh, they they have to look themselves in the mirror and be honest with themselves. And I think great players do that. Yeah, absolutely. The guys that try to grind and get better. I I do think the better of a player, you know, you look now now there's proof in the pudding of the kids that we recruited and where they ended up and why. 
looking back on it, it was the guys that looked themselves in the mirror and just they knew where they were and where they wanted to be. Yep. And you, you were right on the head right there when it says to surround yourself with people that are going to be honest with you. You have to have people that are honest with you. And I've, I've been in a situation before where I had a mom approach me in the past and it was his junior year. And obviously, you know, you know, the higher end range. And I don't, I don't know if there's an SLA percentage of that 25 to 40% of guys or 50% of guys recruited at that sophomore age for, for big D ones. You know, by the time we're in that second or third week in the summer for 17, most of those big schools don't really have much money left, if at all. Um, and, and this, this, this mom approached me and said, well, his hitting coach, who I'm not going to mention on the podcast, who's very popular, um, very well known, um, and was basically saying he could play in any division one school in the country that he wants. And we're at the end of his junior year. And now this, and this kid's for kids, a phenomenal kid, never had an issue with the kid. And he's actually going to a good school now and, and took the long route to that good school. Um, but he was being told a certain thing. And what I said, and this is my response is I see what that person is saying, but it's not there yet. And I think that's the big, the big problem is that like people confuse, like you're saying is like that person can play at that high level, but it doesn't mean that they're in there now. And what really matters is, is understanding that and working toward getting to that level and not like, don't, if you think that your coach is telling you something like that, that your kid could play at a high D one, you need to ask very much details. When can he play in that D1? Is JUCO around? Is, you know, going to a different school first? And, and you know, down south, JUCO is huge, and there are superstars. Like Adam came. Adam, you went to wh – where did you go before? South Alabama? Like, yeah, Fa Faulkner State Community College, about an hour far away. Yeah, and, and you went all the way up to AAA, correct? Yep. And so, like – and Adam was the, the best hitter on our team his junior year, arguably the best hitter on our team for two straight years. And, and, and there's a big ass and I was a big recruited guy out of school. That doesn't mean that I was better than Adam or Adam was better than me. And what matters is that we both had this route and, you know, everybody projects at different levels. And I think that people need to have those honest people around them. Cause if you have people that are around them, they're telling you what you want to hear. There's probably a problem there. Cause there's gotta be some uncomfortableness in those conversations a little bit. Is there anything you want to add on to that, Adam? Well, it's just funny earlier when we mentioned, uh, we never had a scout watch us when we were 14 or 15. Mm -hmm. I promise you they wouldn't have liked what they saw when I was 14 or 15 years <laughs> old. <laughs> uh, project, no projectability. Average, yeah. <laughs> so it's just you got to choose the route going back to it. Of don't get caught up because your buddy's going to these other schools. That if junior college is the route for you, go there and you're going to grow there, both academically and on the field. I think that's mm -hmm. another thing that doesn't get talked about enough is – mentally and academically as well as I was 17 when I graduated I wasn't ready to go into a classroom full of 250 kids like I just wasn't there yet so I needed the junior college route to get me comfortable and I was from a smaller town this JUCO I went to is a smaller town it wasn't like a big jump to me where if I go to the University of Alabama I get caught up into the round crowd or love the football team and then all of a sudden I don't ever play baseball again so and another thing going back to it is look where you're going to play if you're all about playing the game of baseball you need to go to the place where you're going to play the most because I promise you sitting the bitch isn't fun and nobody wants to go anywhere and sit the bench but yet hey I went to this big school but I said the bench for four years well that doesn't really say anything because you only get one chance to play this game uh, one thing I want to ask you Scott is just what are some things that you can tell the parents that college recruiters are looking for, whether it's appearance or character, how they carry their stuff on the field, just what are some keys that they look for? Besides the obvious uh, tools that we've, we've talked about, um, you always try to find out what kind of teammate they are. I mean, these kids have to co coexist with 34 other guys. Um, that matters. Um, their background, multiple sports. Did they play multiple sports? That was – that was something for me that, that I liked. Um, if they were a position player, I, I would dig into some stats, their high school stats the previous couple of years just to see where they were. Um, but just, just good people. Um, when they came on campus, if they were doing some of the talking and not just their parents talking, that was a big deal for me. So, like, when – that was a big deal for me and Rich. So, when a kid came, let's say he brought both of his parents, um, we want to make sure that the kid had a voice in the room and, and had enough and would take enough initiative to, to ask his own questions and, and be a part of the process. Typically, those guys were go-getters. Those guys were, were, were the, 
the type A type guys that you look for. Um, and that was, that was something that we liked. So that, that, that's what I would say. Yes, absolutely. Um, can you break down for, so uh, the rules change every single year. Can you break down what is allowed uh, from the freshman year of the recruiting process at that 14 to 15 year range all the way to, to, to the junior year and how kind of things change year to year? And obviously, um, we talk about this all the time, but for basically break it down for people that are listening that might not know anything about yeah. it. Yeah, so I had to make a call to make sure I was, I think I'm right. So how, <laughs> let's just say I think I'm right, but who knows? So if you're a 14, 15, if you're, let's say, eighth grade freshman, or sophomore, this is all very similar, or it's, it's the same. Mm-hmm. If, if a coach wants to reach out to you, he has to go through your summer coach, your high school coach. He cannot contact you personally. You have to contact them. So, that, you know, we set up phone calls for these kids. Um, when a school calls me and wants to talk to a kid, I text him, say, give him a time, he gets a hold of me. At that point, you cannot go on campus on any kind of a visit. You can go to their camps, okay? You're not supposed to be offered at a camp. Mm-hmm. So they cannot offer you in person at a camp. They cannot talk scholarship money at a camp. Once you get past your sophomore year, September 1, as you're entering your junior year, you can take – now you can take official visits your junior year. If you take one your junior year, you cannot take one your senior year. So you only get one official visit per school. And I don't know if the limit is still five. We had five back in the day. And it was still five a couple of years ago. I didn't ask for the limit, but you can only take one official visit your junior year or senior year to a school. Mm-hmm. You can take unofficial visits at your own cost anytime you want after September 1 of, of your junior year. Mm-hmm. Um, but that's pretty much where it opens up and the, and the rules become the same for a junior and a senior. Mm-hmm. So uh, you're seeing – this is why you're seeing a lot of guys – trying to lock up players their sophomore summer before everybody in the country can just call them freely. Mm-hmm. So, and that's, that's smart on the recruiter's part, to be honest. Yep. Um, and then at that point they can call you, you can call them, you can text. Uh, communication after September 1 of your junior year is pretty free. So um, I think that's about it. You still sign a national letter of intent. Uh, yeah. November senior year and that that's the only thing binding to you to that school so any verbal uh, commitment really has no bearing other than the fact that it's probably a handshake deal mm-hmm. and I'm, you I'm glad that you yeah I'm glad you mentioned the verbal handshake because I think a lot of kids will get caught up into the verbal stuff but they don't realize that that can get taken away at any time if you quit working and quit improving they're kind of right. we talked we talked about the projectability is just because you verbally shake hands with somebody and say we're ready to roll don't get lazy and just kind of back off everything you have to go even harder just to make sure you keep that spot yeah and i mean you could point at the school that that would let a kid go um, and and there, everybody has a story about a school letting a kid go. You could point at the school, but you also get to point at the mm-hmm. player a little bit. Yeah, you got to look yourself. But anybody who commits to a school when they're young in our, in our organization will know what that means, and you better keep working. So uh, glad you brought that up. Absolutely. Um, so, you know, and we talked about the factors in deciding a school, and we talked about that process. You know, when – Everybody obviously wants to play at the highest levels at Division One baseball and all that stuff. And, and you know, play, and I always tell everybody, college baseball is college baseball. Playing at any level beyond high school is a big deal. Um, and there's guys that play in the MLB. And what I think I saw something where like 40 to some odd percent of guys that are playing the MLB were not Division One baseball players or something like that. Um, I, I might be just, you know, re- remembering something from Twitter that might not be correct. But that basically what it means is, is there's a bunch of different avenues to take to be able to get to that highest level. When do you advise guys on saying, hey, you need to open up your options to being able to go to any level, not just D1? When do you talk to you guys about that? Um, that's a good question. And I'm going to start talking to them a little bit earlier about it mm-hmm. because I think kids will hold out for maybe a D1 offer until their senior year when I think they should be more open. Uh, the education piece comes into play. With some of these people that don't want to go to junior college, 
And I don't like, I don't necessarily like that, but to each their own. Okay. But if you're truly wanting to be a ball player and take the route that Adam took, I think that route is, is a good route. Now in Indiana, we only have one junior college in the state. Mm -hmm. So in Alabama, you guys, I mean, probably 30, 40. Yeah, there so it is. Kids don't grow up in Indiana thinking about junior college as much. Illinois, yeah, they more junior colleges. Ohio only has a couple. So we're not as comfortable or not as familiar with junior college as you guys are down there. But it's a good option for those kids that want to play at the highest level, to be honest with you, because I don't know how many offers you had out of JUCO, but I've called several junior college kids the past four or five years, and they have more offers than any – Indiana Bull ever had. Yeah. I mean, there's there's guys that had 30, 40 offers after a good weekend on the mound. Mm -hmm. um, so, and you brought up a great point. If 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 playing time is your is your number one priority, um, you better be a high scholarship guy at a at a four year school or look at the junior college route. In, in my opinion. So. Yeah, and I'm glad you hit on the high scholarship because that was kind of the next question I wanted to lead to is can you explain what a good scholarship is at the Division One level? Okay, they, they get 11-7. So each, each school gets 11.7. Only 27 can be on scholarship. There's 35 players on a roster. Um, some guys will be brought in as a non-rostered walk-on um, where they can, they can compete for those eight spots. Now, not every Division One school has 27 guys on scholarship. Some of them, depending on the year, might only have 23, 24, which means they have more walk-ons. So, but the roster has to be cut uh, the week before the first game, I believe, or at the, at, during the first game. The roster has to be cut to 35. So with that 11-7, obviously we're partial scholarships. Um, some schools can stack academic and athletic, and I was able to do that. Uh, at, at my old school and that's always a good situation so you know the better of student your son is the more opportunity he has to, to to gain money we always said you know the scholarship amount depends on not only how good you are but also the priority that we put on that position so your catchers your shortstops your pitchers anybody that can play in the middle of the field except maybe the second baseman so if you think a guy can play short, center field, catch, and pitch, you're going to probably pay those guys first. Mm -hmm. And, and it, they have to give you – if they give you a scholarship, at least at the Division One level, it has to be at least 25%. Um, had several guys on 25% gave out one full ride in six years, and he's in the big leagues. Um, so a good scholarship – I mean, for an arm, for me, for an arm would be 50 to 75, 50 to 65, 70 percent. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I think this is where you see a lot of different um, scenarios in college baseball. I can't speak to, to too many other schools. I just know that we were always somewhere in between that 30 to 70 range with guys if we could. We didn't want to feel like we were nickel and diamond guys at 25. And we really couldn't afford to give 80% to, to everybody. Mm -hmm. And to be fair, a lot of the no-brainer type guys that go, let's say, go to a bigger school, maybe they get that money even from the bigger school because there are no dollars. Um, at, a, at a smaller school, it's, it's more of a projection. So, But some people, I mean, money matters different for, for everybody. And some people end up at a – at a school because they can afford to pay more. Um, if that makes sense. So, that's good. Yeah. Yep. And that's definitely that. And the open communication and that there's a lot of schools, obviously, you know, the Vandys of the world that they can do a lot of things um, academically that other schools can't. Um, and we're talking about while we're on scholarships right now. Um, and this is something that is overlooked and the people don't understand is, you know, college baseball is a business. These coaches make these decisions on scholarships on their livelihood. You know, you, they make money. They got to put food on the table for the children, even though they enjoy what they're doing, you know, explain to the parents uh, about scholarships, you know, how they are not promised for four years, how some institutions may say that they're going to be promised for four years, but and realistically, 
you know, year to year scholarship wise, you know, how would you approach in explaining that to a parent and a player? Yeah, you, you sign your NLI, your senior in high school that, that promises you your scholarship for, for your freshman year. Then you sign, you, you basically re-sign that agreement every single year. So it's okay. a one-year contract. Um, I can't speak to how guys cut scholarships or don't cut scholarships. So we, just, we just never cut scholarships. I do think things are in play at a lot of institutions where they're not allowed to. Uh, so I'm, I definitely will not mention a particular school in this case, but I'll just tell you that uh, you need, that's, that's another thing or another reason to have a good, strong relationship with the head coach. Mm-hmm. So, you know, you can always walk in his office and look him in the eye and talk to him about whatever you want to talk to him about. Um, and when it comes to scholarships, I mean, I some places, you know, maybe if you don't perform, they pull your scholarship. Yep. Is that on the player? Is that on the school? That's, that's I think, an individual. I think each situation is different. Mm-hmm. Now, we could pull scholarship – if you were academically ineligible, if you became academically ineligible, or if you had, um, you know, you got in trouble with the law or something. So that, those are the two things that we could pull scholarship for. We never really had to. Yep. And uh, I'll kind of use my story a little bit and I'll dive in. Um, <clears throat> I, I'm going to start out with, I love South Alabama. I wouldn't trade that for anything in the world. Um, and Adam knows, you know, kind of the adversity and the trials and tribulations we had as a, as a top top program, but a mid-major program at the same time. But I was, I went on scholarship South Alabama. Um, and my first year I showed up, I had uh, fractures in my L4, L5, S1, tearing my ligaments and in, and I had some disc issues, um, some degenerative disc issues. And the first year I was, I was still on the scholarship that I committed to. And I had to go in there after the first year, taking a medical red shirt, uh, cause I couldn't play obviously. And they basically said, like, hey, we've got to cut your scholarship down. And they didn't really cut it. And I'll give them credit to this is they didn't cut it much, but they cut it, you know, enough to piss you off, obviously. But at the same time, like, you got to look at it from both ends of the spectrum. Like, I, you know, I was 19 years old. I didn't do anything to produce to the program that first year. And so I understand, like, even though I'm 12 hours away from where I, I you know, in Indiana, you know, they've got only a certain amount of scholarships. They had to give some of that money to somebody else in order to pick people up. And I understood that. And one thing that I will say is they said, hey, if you produce next year and you show up, your scholarship will be right back where it was. And, and, and you do what you're supposed to do. And so, you know, I have a lot of respect in that aspect of things. And I could definitely see both avenues. And there's a lot of, organiz- a lot of programs. And again, we won't mention any that, you know, say you're injured. All right, peace, you're gone. And, and that's one thing that South, like, you know, they did things and I, and looking back on it, you know, no matter what you, somebody's taking money away from you, you're going to be mad no matter the situation. Cause I knew what I could produce and knew what I could do. And again, I ended up having a good couple of years and, and I, my back didn't really heal for three years until my junior year of college and I, where I felt okay. Um, and even with that, like they still kept their commitment to at least produce me some sort of scholarship money. So, um, and that, that was, that was how South Alabama took that route. But there's definitely schools and in, in, in French, we were just talking to about a guy the other day that we won't mention that his school and we released him and boom, he lost his scholarship. Um, and he's at a different place now. But that's something that people got to understand is like, you know, and me and Adam talk about this all the time. Like you got to stay healthy and you, the, the preparation that you do between college and high school, like the weight room, all that stuff. Like you got to stay healthy because um, that's not only if you don't produce on the field, they can take it away, but injuries, they can take it away. And, and some schools, they're always trying to recruit the bigger, better person. And just like at South, like we were always, they always try to recruit new guys to replace you. That's, that's just baseball. They're trying to, they're trying to create that environment. Um, Adam, is there anything you want to add on to that? No, I think that's the cool thing. Cause I mean, I think speaking of South Alabama, that was kind of the difference between, I want to say when Kitchell was there, all the scholarships were honored for four years. And that was one of the adjustments when Calvi came was, he kind of took that away and it was a year to year thing. And I don't think he'll mind me saying that we talk about it all the time, mm-hmm. but it helped get their program back to going to regionals again too, where it yep. wasn't a, Hey, you came here, you didn't project, you didn't turn out what we thought you were going to be, but yet you're stuck giving them that scholarship versus 
hey, you didn't put up this year, uh, you weren't, your work ethic wasn't good, you were late to workouts, whatever it was from that standpoint. So you're going to kind of get punished a little bit from – it's kind of just your way and your options. And I see, whereas the player side, you like you mentioned, it's, you're upset, it rattles you up, but it also might make you come back the following year. Hey, I'm going to prove a point to get that good scholarship back. Hey, Scott, what uh, I want to kind of bring up the parent situation on – how to handle it both when you were a college recruiting coordinator and now in the position you're in of how important it is to not be overbearing or kind of like track you guys down or follow you around and let you do your job when you're there to watch the player. Yeah, no doubt. I mean, I think uh, it's, it's just being respectful. I think you just got to put your, um, you got to keep in mind that that's their job. And let's say if you're a school teacher and I walked in your classroom, I mean, wouldn't you think that's a little bit weird? By watching your classroom, just started talking to you. So, yeah. I, are you are you sure you're teaching this right, Scott? Like this, you're not right. teaching this right. Right. <laughs> two plus two is not four. Um, so yeah, it, I've only seen a couple. I mean, I've only been a part of it a couple times to where the, the parent would just get so involved, um, and that'll turn you off. I mean, that that that'll definitely turn you off. You gotta let your. At the end of the day, you gotta let your child make or break his own career. So it, it's up to your child. It, just know that the, the the guys that are wearing the polos, watching the games, the stopwatches, and all that, they're smart enough to figure it out. Mm -hmm. um, we're in a we're in a world now where kids are getting missed, missed less because there's so many more scouts at games. Uh, these guys are guys are out. I mean, these college guys are grinding, and mm -hmm. wait till they wait till they're let on the road again. I mean, you're going to see them every day. And you do anyway, most of the time. Mm -hmm. So kids aren't getting missed. It's just parents need to be patient. Um, that's, that's easier for some than others. But um, Man, and, and a lot of that's because they're seeing their teammates. Mm -hmm. you know, that situation a lot of times becomes when they see their teammates start to commit or whatever else. Yeah. And I don't want to call it jealousy. I, just, I, I wouldn't say that. I just – there's a sense of urgency. Mm -hmm. in that situation yeah like it's understandable they just got to be respectful yeah fear of missing out and that's it's weird so you're saying the parent that rubbernecks it's really loud and you know it's constantly going to the dugout and constantly talking to coaches like that actually hurts the kid that's that's kind of crazy isn't it amazing that we have to say that stuff yeah and at some point you got to stop carrying your son's uh, backpack oh my god yeah don't even get me started on that. That's a rule. Like drinks, no drinks during the game. And you'd be surprised, like, how many people get get upset about saying, hey, don't bring get drinks in the middle of the game. Like, get everything they're ready before the game, and then boom. Like, it's, yeah. it's the game's on. Um, yeah. And we had, we've had parents, and, I, you know, it's, it's one of those conversations where you don't want to embarrass them in front of other people obviously because that, that puts a problem but you got to pull them off to the side and it's a delicate conversation because you want to explain to them like listen like if there's a college coach there leave him alone let him do what he's wanted to do like don't tell him that he hit 95 playing wiffle ball in the backyard like nobody cares like let him do what he's supposed to do and 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 the, here's the thing whatever you say as a parent is not going to help your son it's not going to help it could only hurt him it could only hurt so and that's like that is something that is missed. And I would say for the most part, our Indiana Bulls pr program, our parents do a phenomenal job and they understand that because they're taught that in the process. Yeah. Um, but there's, there's definitely one or two things that, and it's most of the time it's not on purpose. They just kind of do it unknowingly and they don't understand kind of the, the, you know, yeah. the bedside manner, if you will, of, of being a parent at that recruiting process. Um, but, you know, when it comes to the parents, you know, and, and, and we're talking about them being overbearing. We're talking about being over-involved. What's your biggest advice to them for that recruiting process for the kid? Like, well, how can they benefit their son the most? What, what, what's your advice to allowing them to maximize their son's potential? Like, what should they do? So with, with all these guys being out, you know, you come to Grand Park, on any given day, you could play in front of 100 people, uh, 100 scouts. They got to realize the anxiety of the player the anxiety of the player that wants to play um, and he's playing in front of, you know, hundreds of scouts and this might be the first season he's really seen scouts like this. I mean, it, it takes, there's enough pressure on him. Um, and some of it's good pressure. Don't get me wrong. The game puts pressure on you. A, now I'm playing in front of all these people who are judging me. B, um, I think the parent needs to uh, just keep that in mind and be a fan. 
and, 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 encourage, and encourage their son because the, the game's putting enough pressure. The recruiting process is putting enough pressure. I think they need to be more like a, like a parent, like a, like, a, like a fan, and just be supportive and be, you know, help them out uh, researching schools and, and, you know, doing different things. Um, and that's where it's kind of, you know, everybody's different. Everybody's looking for something. But th- at the end of the day, the parent and the player have to realize that you might want one thing, but uh, it, it, it's all about what opportunities are, are put in front of you. So um, they just got to understand that. Just because I want to go to school A doesn't mean I get to go to school A. You know, I got I to gotta be ready for school B, C, and D and, and keep all of my options open and be ready to um, – you know, do, do my own research as it, as it comes uh, my way because the, the player doesn't get a pick where they go all, all the time. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's great. That's great advice. If, if you do, that's great for you. I mean, it, yeah. if, if, you get, if you have all those options, which very few do, mm-hmm. um, that's great for you. But for most of us, it's I might, I might have wanted to go to school A, but here I got B, C, and D, and now it's, now it's time for me to focus on B, C, and D. Mm-hmm. That's, all, that's awesome. Can you talk about the times that we're in now with, I think before we came on today about the virtual recruiting going on because there's no games going on. People are watching social media bullpens, uh, maybe old highlights they have. Can you, for both parents and players, kind of stress how important it is that you're putting good stuff on social media and not the bad stuff? Because I think you can almost do more harm than good by the stuff that you're putting out there. Uh, you're just saying as far as the content or the videos? Content, uh, the right? content, yeah. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. So your social media really matters. Um, it doesn't matter necessarily. I mean, people aren't going aren't gonna to pick you apart. But if, if you have something bad, then that is sometimes a deal breaker. Mm-hmm. Hey, be a kid, you know get after your friends or whatever, retweet, do whatever you want. But if you start getting into gray areas, um, it can only work against you. Mm-hmm. Now, you put a nice video or, you know, whatever. I, we got several players in the bowl that have been posting videos. And I think it's great. That's uh, awesome, yeah. Yeah, that doesn't hurt at all. Mm-hmm. And you're supposed to be a kid. But yeah. your social media is monitored mm-hmm. uh, for sure. So. Yeah, that's definitely something overlooked with guys because, you know, if you have guys on campus and you're watching the guys on the field, like how how are they carrying themselves, their character on the field, how they're having a conversation face-to-face with coaches? Like, you know, is that player, you know, calling me back or or, or so forth? Is is he having a hold of a conversation? Like that, that's all character stuff that you – is the exact same thing on social media. Like there's a lot of guys that can put on a front and person and then they act like a completely different person on social media. So it's very easy nowadays, especially with unfor- as, as unforgiving as social media is, is how to find out who's the real deal when it comes to the character standpoint and things. Um, that's it's, it's, it's way too easy for coaches to see, you know, which guys are doing things right or which guys are doing things wrong in that aspect of things. Um, when it comes to the rules and anything, is there anything that you think that may, we have not, we, we may have left out or haven't talked about that you think that is important for the parents and the, and the players to know when it comes to that recruiting process? Yeah, I do want, um, I, I meant to mention this. We were talking scholarship. So let's talk about uh, when you walk on to university. Okay. Right? That's a good one. Yeah. Yep. So, and, and Hey, at the division one level, we had several walk-ons come in and really contribute. Like once you get there, in most programs, okay, once you get there, it doesn't matter if they gave you 80% or they gave you zero and you had to pay for 30 camps to get there. Um, once you're in the program, you're on team. You're being coached. If you're the better player, you should play. And, and most of the time you do. Now, the, the legality of it is this. If you're a walk-on at any school, you can be cut at any time. Mm-hmm. So that's the only thing that I would – uh, and, and some people say, well, is that a guaranteed roster spot, non-guaranteed roster spot? It, it doesn't matter what you're told. If you walk on to, to a place, uh, you can be cut at any time. Mm-hmm. So, and in some places, you know, the cut scholarship, maybe your scholarship can be cut. But, but you can be cut as a walk-on. They can bring in – you can have 50 guys at, at fall baseball if you want to. 
but you have to get down to 35, um, yeah. you know, in the spring. So I just wanted to talk about that. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up actually, because it brought me to this, this question. What if somebody gets an offer, you know, uh, an offer? And obviously one thing we didn't mention is D3 yeah, is D, division three scholarships are academic only, correct? Yes. Yeah, and so I that's think thing. D2's got 10 scholarships, but I'm not sure. D2's 10 scholarships, yep. And it's, already, it's around there, 10, 10 to 11, somewhere in there, for a fully funded program. Okay, and explain the JUCO scholarships as well. Um, I believe a certain level, I, don't, I think D2 can offer scholarship, D, D1 can offer room and board and scholarship. Adam, do you, do you know anything differently than that? I, so in the state of Alabama, all you can get is room and board. And gotcha. tuition, yeah. I mean, sorry, the other way around. You'll get tuition, your books, and everything. You have to pay for room. Pay for room. You have to pay room and board. Okay. Yes, that is correct. I, I think I think the majority of those are like that. I do know a couple D one JUCOs that pay room and board. And yes. I don't think they pay for everybody room and board. They might have so many, but I I need to look into that. That's, it's a, a, that's a good question. Yeah, because in Florida as well as Mississippi, they can give that, and they'll give the stipend as well. So that's almost that's why some guys will leave to go to those states. Now, in the state of Mississippi, they're only allowed three non-Mississippi kids to come over. So they're very oh, wow. select. Yeah, they're very selective on which ones they pull into. So there's a little bit more rules in there. But in the whole state of Alabama, I think that's more common across the country. Is it will take care of the tuition and books. You have to take okay. care of room and board. So. Um, it, it, it turns out to be way better financially for most. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, the, the JUCO round. So. Yeah. Say a guy is getting offered a JUCO, um, a JUCO round. This happens a lot. You get guys they offer that are at, at the D2 level or maybe a JUCO level offered scholarship or a preferred walk-on or just a walk-on spot at a Division I uh, university. This happens all the time. Uh, I had a lefty this past year that I think had played a lot of D1s that, you know, you know didn't exactly get some of those offers. Um, What's your advice on guys like that? Um, how do you make that decision? And I know that's obviously a personal thing, um, but I, I, I really get irritated when people don't understand that JUCO is a great route that you could take. Um, what's what, what's a what's a advice that you have on that, Scott? Well, I think um, it is personal as far as is it education you're after, is it playing time you're after. I think how good's the program type of thing. Mm -hmm. um, Kids will walk on to good programs a lot, a lot more than they'll walk on to bad programs. Yep. If that makes sense. Um, I would not walk on to a losing program if I had a good D2 offer. Yep. If, if that makes sense. And I would always take a look at the junior college. Program. Yep. Um, I always tell guys like the development aspect and what's going to, what's going to make you a better player. That's probably the biggest factor there. Like ignore the D1 and there obviously there's going to be something else. Oh, D1 and they don't have a money issue, they're gone. Um, yeah. But the development aspect of things for me is, is most important. I had a guy that I trained at LT that's making the transition from uh, a D2 program to a JUCO program with, with hopes of going to a D1 program, but he's leaving that. The first program he's leaving because there was no development. There was he just not happy with the situation that he's in. Yeah. Um, so that, that's one of many people in that aspect of things. There, there's a lot of guys. The development is such an overlooked part of the process, and it's not asked about enough, I think, on scholarships because people walk into colleges and they're like, you know, especially at the higher, the bigger, bigger schools, they're like, oh, wow, this is the facilities here. This is this. It doesn't matter how nice the facilities are if there's not something that's worth, worth a damn coaching. Uh, the one thing I'll add to this, if, you, if, if you're able to have a visit on a campus, and I don't care if it's JUCO, D2, D3, D1, so if you're old enough, if you're old enough to be on campus and, and you get to see the team work out and you get to, you know, you meet the coaches in person, make sure the, the, the player, you know, if I'm talking to parents here, make sure your son has a conversation with players mm -hmm. that play in that program. You'd be very surprised that the players mm -hmm. do not lie. Yep. In my own recruiting process 20 years ago, I had three or four guys at one university say, do not come here. <laughs> and the great advice. I, I'm not, I'm not yeah. lying. They were older. They were 21, yeah. 22 years old. They, they had bad experiences. These were guys that even played. Mm -hmm. One guy was their starting center, you know, starting center fielder. And he said, do not come. And I said, okay. <laughs> That's probably the best advice you just gave right there. It's something we completely overlooked to thinking about is ask the players. It's, it's like with any business, ask the boots on the ground. They're going to give you the biggest honest opinion on, on, on the situation, whether it's an organization, a business, and especially in college baseball. 
Um, yeah. That's great advice. At the end of the day, you got to take, uh, I think when you're making a decision as well, you got to take baseball out of the equation for a second and say, would I go to school here? Would I have a good experience here? Am I going to enjoy this? Baseball, you, you should enjoy playing the game of baseball. If you go to a program where you're not, where you're not enjoying what you do, you won't develop like you want. You won't have a good experience. Good programs always have strong alumni bases that come back. I mean, you guys are still talking about South Alabama because you guys had a great experience there and you won a lot of yep. games. Yep. Um, I, I do think uh, that 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 came into play with me. It's just um, being around winning baseball and knowing that I was going to enjoy myself too. Mm-hmm. Adam, is there anything else you want to jump in and ask about? Uh, yeah, just kind of, yeah, kind of at the end. Can you just talk about how important it is that with your and Sean's role of how you have to be 100% honest with college coaches when they ask you about players? Because I think a lot of per- parents' perception is maybe uh, Sean works with my kid. He's he's a good buddy of my. He's I treat him almost like a friend. But when it comes down to it, Sean has to be totally honest. If a coach is calling and asking, how hard does this kid throw? Can you just talk about that? Yeah, I mean, um, for programs like the Bulls and the Knights, um, you know, obviously the program's bigger than any one coach and the program's bigger than any one player. We, we want this – this program's been around for 20 years. We want it to be around for 200 more. So to have that uh, respect from the college and pro, pro community, we have to deal with, a, with an honest situation to where we might give our opinion and think one thing, but I think here's where, you know, we're at and here's the nuts and bolts is this is where we are right now. And a lot of times, uh, just so the families out there understand, most of the time when a college coach goes up to a Sean Laird or a Scott French and says, hey, what do you got on so-and-so? Most of the time it's work ethic related. Uh, um, does he show up on time? Is he a good teammate? Stuff like that. They want to evaluate – for the most part, college coaches want to evaluate for themselves. Or pro scouts, they trust themselves before they'll ever trust me or Sean. Mm-hmm. Now, if they're asking about a velo or something that's concrete, that's – yeah, that's given. We're not lying about that. That's for sure. Yep. If we have to be – I mean, everybody involved has to be, uh, I guess, honorable and, and respectful of, of, uh, of the game. So. hmm Definitely. Yeah. And we have to be honest. If the kid, if the parents an ass or the kid is, we have to be honest in that aspect of things. It doesn't mean it's a personal thing, but you know, the Scott French is at Ball state or, you know, you know, Mercer at IU. If we, if we approach them and we tell them anything that is not a hundred percent, the truth, it's, they're not going to believe anything that we say after that. It has to be an honest, it has to be an honest evaluation, honest situation. And like, like French said, like, we talk about the character. We talk about the work ethic. We talk about the, you know, the actual metrics, the physical things that we can say, and then things they need to work on. I, I, I always take the adage of I want to, I will give too much info if possible. Um, and, but at the end of the day, like, like, like French just said, like, they're always going to trust their own opinions, even though sometimes I feel like that we know better. <laughs> <laughs> the only thing I really don't want to get into like is uh, academics. Yeah. Because when I was on the other side, I had so many kids lie to me about their GPA mm-hmm. anyway. So I don't want to be put in a situation or put Sean in a situation where a family says, oh, yeah, little Johnny's got a 3.4. He tells um, IU, Purdue, whatever, hey, little Johnny's got a 3.4. Purdue recruits him for a month and then gets his transcript. And he's got a 2.5. Little Johnny's got to go to junior count. Oh, yeah. You know what I mean? So I don't. that's why I don't mess with academics because – that's between the family and the school, in my opinion. Mm-hmm. That's between the family and the school. So the school has ways of getting it. They'll, they'll, they'll get it. They'll figure it out. That's a, that's a good point. That's a really good point. Sometimes we trust what we see, what we hear a lot of times instead of, you know, that let those guys make those decisions and look that up themselves, make that decision yeah. themselves. I mean, we can have a radar gun and see 90 miles an hour. But unless I had every, every player's transcript, I, I wouldn't be able to talk about it academics and that's why i leave that up to the family and the school that's awesome well Frenchie, man we appreciate having on uh, coming on today man is there any final advice that you have for you know high school guys that want to play at that college level anything that you you know that, that, that you know you've been around a long time you've seen a lot of guys you know you know you've seen the theme of the guys that perform at the highest levels and if there's anything you want to add here like you know 
uh, go ahead and shoot and your opinion on this. Well, I just think now more than ever in the situation that we're in, um, you got to stay on your grind. Mm-hmm. I think you got to you got to control what you can control. You you got to you know become the best athlete and the best baseball player and the best teammate that you can be. Um, if you start getting recruited, make sure you communicate. Um, you know, make sure you communicate as they want you to. Make sure you have um, – you're the one being recruited. Your parents aren't being recruited. You're being recruited. They will help you out with the process. But you're going to get recruited when you earn it. Mm-hmm. If, you th- if you can think of it like that. You're going to get recruited when you earn it. So go out and earn it. And good luck to all of you. Thanks for having us on or having me on. Adam, good to meet you too. Yeah, nice to meet you as well. You did an awesome job. Awesome. awesome man. Man. Well, we appreciate it, buddy. And until next time, guys, uh, make sure you guys review and uh, give us that five-star rating. And we'll see you guys later.